The question of whether the government's doing enough to bring Taiwanese human trafficking victims home turns political. Another high-profile foreign delegation visits Taiwan, this time the governor from the U.S. state of Indiana. Taiwan's new controversial bill that would regulate the content of online platforms has been put on hold after a nationwide backlash. And another sweet victory as Taiwan wins the 2022 Junior League Baseball World Series Championship in the U.S. A warm welcome to Time Plus News. I'm Ika Vat. 72 Taiwanese rescued from traffickers in Cambodia are now safely home. In some cases, lawmakers have intervened directly to get these victims back. But hundreds more are still being held captive, and Taiwan's two main political parties are at odds about whether the government has done enough. John Van Trias has more. For five Taiwanese citizens, Sunday was the end of a nightmare. Like hundreds of others, they were tricked into going to Cambodia with a promise of high-paying jobs. Waiting for them instead was a prison. Human traffickers beat them and even threatened to remove their organs. The five landed home with the help of Wu Li Hua, a lawmaker from the Democratic Progressive Party. She organized interest-free loans so that relatives could pay the ransom for their release. Wu is not the only lawmaker trying to repatriate victims of trafficking. Three others from the opposition Kuomintang, or KMT, went to Cambodia last week, where they met with locally-based Taiwanese to discuss the rescue of captives. They also brought one victim back with them. But rather than a common rallying point for Taiwan's two big parties, the fight against human trafficking has become the center of a political blame game. This just months before a midterm election. One of the Guomindang lawmakers who went to Cambodia has accused the government of not doing enough. But Foreign Minister Joseph Wu says it's the traffickers who deserve blame, not the diplomats trying to help. And the Interior Minister says the government is determined to act. Police at Taiwan's main Taoyuan International Airport have been patrolling with signs warning of recruitment scams in Southeast Asia. Various political groups say they are trying to bring back at least 300 citizens who have been trafficked. But instead of being a unifying factor, it's revealed another fault line in Taiwan's fractious political landscape. Damon Lin and John Van Trieste for Taiwan Plus. The governor of the U.S. state of Indiana, Eric Holcomb, has arrived in Taiwan. He has met with Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen, and will meet with Foreign Minister Joseph Wu and leaders from the semiconductor industry. Holcomb is the latest high-profile U.S. politician to visit the country in recent weeks, following the visits of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and a congressional delegation led by Senator Ed Markey. Holcomb says he is looking forward to developing ties between Taiwan and Indiana. Because we share so many common values and interests and goals, there are more opportunities ahead of us than I think there ever have been before for us to continue to strengthen and cultivate and nurture uh, this relationship as our economies grow and grow together we will continue to seek to build strategic partnerships with you. A group of bipartisan Japanese lawmakers has also arrived in Taiwan. The delegation is led by Keiji Furuya from Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party. He's the chair of a consultative council that oversees relations between Japan and Taiwan. Before his trip, Furuya wrote on Twitter that 
Countries with shared values must coordinate closely. While in Taiwan, the group of lawmakers will meet with President Tsai Ing-wen, Foreign Minister Joseph Wu and senior Taiwanese defense officials. To find out more about the visit and Tokyo's response to China's live fire drills, during which missiles landed in Japan's exclusive economic zone, our reporter James Chater spoke to Eleanor Shiori Hughes. She's a Japan foreign relations analyst at EconView in Washington, D.C. Do you think there is appetite for more trips of this nature in Tokyo? And what other directions do you see relations between Tokyo and Taiwan developing going forward? I don't anticipate that the momentum that Tokyo currently has in terms of sending um, lawmakers to Taipei will change in the near term. Um, it's too early to say whether that will be the same case in the long term as, but at the very least in terms of limitations, um, you know, the United States and, and uh, Taiwan jointly announced that they're going to launch or in the process of initiating trade dialogue. Um, but I don't, that's something that, for example, that I don't anticipate Japan doing. Um, you know, one unique thing about Japan is that, you know, unlike Taiwan and Australia at the very least, you know, Japan has not yet, I'll say, yet being the operative word, has not yet been subject to um, a big amount of economic coercion from China. And that's something that it's very, um, you know, worried about because it depends heavily um, economically on the PRC. What has the response been in Japan to China's live fire drills? The Japanese government officials um, and um, analysts who are based in Tokyo or watch Japan, Japanese foreign policy and security closely are quite alarmed by the fact that um, out of the 11 missiles that, um, Chinese, that China fired, that five of them landed in Japan's exclusive economic zone for the first time. And shortly after Nancy Pelosi made her visit, there was a Japanese think tank that um, actually convened and had a, some sort of a war game that basically, you know, one takeaway from that war game was that the Japanese don't have um, adequate uh, resources or not good, sufficient, not going to do a good job that perhaps, you know, evacuating its own citizens in the um, event of a military, con that China orchestrates a military contingency. So at the very least, I think they are thinking about that. Have the Chinese actions caused a shift or an acceleration in terms of the level of urgency with which Taiwan is viewed or is perceived amongst Japan's politicians? I would say to some extent, most definitely, um, especially because some of Japanese um, island assets, namely those uh, Okinawa, like Yonaguni Island, are, uh, for example, is only 110 kilometers away from Taiwan Island proper. So going forward, when um, high-level officials from Tokyo meet with their Chinese counterparts, not only will Taiwan's um, security um, feature more prominently in these talks, but, you know, I think, you know, the Japanese government will also continue to emphasize that just because, you know, China is acting more belligerent in multiple ways, whether it be economic coercion, military drills or cyber or otherwise, you know, Japan will still always be open to dialogue with China. And that could be perhaps, a you know, um, not necessarily the most welcome news for Taiwan, because that could mean that Japan cannot then, on the other hand, um, I guess, open or um, on a bilateral basis have economic uh, dialogues with Taiwan. China kicked off another round of military drills in the East China Sea on Monday. China has stepped up its military presence in the region since the visit of U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan earlier this month. Warships and fighter planes have been spotted in waters near Taiwan every day since the visit. Some have crossed the median line of the Taiwan Strait. That line is an unofficial marker which the United States created in the 1950s, separating Taiwan from China. The U.S. is also in the middle of military exercises in Korea as it seeks to strengthen its security partnerships in the region. Taiwan's military is adjusting its physical requirements in order to increase the number of people who are eligible for conscription. The Defense Ministry is planning to adjust the BMI or body mass index range and its policy towards certain immune system conditions for mandatory military service. Under the new regulations, people who are between 155 and 157 centimetres tall must still perform an alternative service. That also includes people that do not meet the BMI range for regular service. Alternative services include duties which are considered non-military, like transportation, police work and firefighting. Some of the standards would return to regulations last seen in 1996. 
Taiwan's mandatory conscription lasts for 12 months, and the country currently has over 160,000 active military personnel. Taiwan's main opposition party, the Kuomintang, or KMT, is calling for the reopening of travel corridors with China. KMT Vice Chair Andrew Xia was speaking in the southeastern Chinese city of Xiamen. He urged the two sides to resume the so-called mini three links. These are transport, postal and trade ties between Taiwan's outlying islands of Jinmen and Matsu and three Chinese cities in Fujian province. They were suspended in February 2020 because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Taiwan's government has panned Shah's visit to China as it comes after Beijing held nearly a week of military drills in waters surrounding Taiwan. Shah says reopening the links would benefit cross-strait exchanges. Two police officers have been killed in the southern city of Tainan. The officers were reportedly investigating a stolen car when they were assaulted and stabbed multiple times. They were rushed to nearby Anhan Hospital but did not survive. The suspect is believed to have stolen one of the officers' firearms before fleeing the scene. Authorities say a search for the attacker is underway. A bill that would regulate the content of online platforms has been frozen amid widespread backlash. Digital service providers fear that it would stifle freedom of speech. Yu Jinghuang has more. Opposition lawmakers are up in arms about a bill called the Digital Intermediary Service Act. The bill is meant to limit online crimes like fraud and spreading false information. But there are concerns about ambiguity of language the scope of the government's authority to intervene, and what the bill will mean for freedom of speech. Online platforms have voiced concerns too, and Taiwan's National Communications Commission, or NCC, says the bill is being put on ice for now. The ruling DPP defended the bill, saying it will counter disinformation. The NCC says that it hasn't been pushing the bill and that hearings about it were only meant to collect opinions. It says a draft of the bill hasn't been submitted to the cabinet either. But the body hasn't laid out a plan for further discussion. Chris Ma and Yu Jing Huang for Time Plus. Coming up, we analyze what upcoming changes to the law in Singapore mean for the country's LGBT population. Stay with us after the break. For more stories from Taiwan and around the world, please make sure to download the Taiwan Plus app. Welcome back. You're watching Taiwan Plus News. Let's take a look at some of the headlines from around the world. 
A car bomb in Russia has killed the daughter of one of President Vladimir Putin's close political allies. Russian investigators say it looks like Daria Dugina was killed by an explosive planted in the SUV she was driving on Saturday night. Her father is Alexander Dugin, an ultra-nationalist who supports Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Father and daughter had attended a concert and reportedly switched cars at the last moment, leading to speculation the bomb was meant for Putin's ally. Singapore has announced it will repeal a law banning sex between men. The colonial era section 377A of the Penal Code outlawing homosexuality carries a sentence of up to two years in prison. It has been on the books in Singapore since the 19th century, although it has not been enforced for years. Prime Minister Li Shenlong announced its repeal on national TV Sunday night, adding that the government will also amend the constitution to define marriage as between a man and a woman, effectively blocking any hope of legalizing same-sex marriage in the country. The government will repeal Section 377A and decriminalize sex between men. I believe this is the right thing to do and something that most Singaporeans will now accept. For more on what this means for Singapore, our reporter Ryan Hokopatrick spoke with Singaporean activist Roy Neng. Activists have been challenging 377A and calling for its repeal for a long time. So is this a victory for equality in Singapore? Many uh, LGBT groups and uh, gay individuals are celebrating online on Facebook. Um, and I think uh, in the immediate uh, effects of it, it is a victory, but then I think we have to look at it from a broader perspective and to look at the implications. The Prime Minister has said that the repeal of 377A will come with a change in the constitution. That to me is a replacement of a discriminatory law with another discriminatory law. As you just said, the law simply isn't being scrapped, but it's being replaced with a new law, a constitutional amendment in fact. So what will the ramifications of that be for LGBT Singaporeans and others throughout society? It is not really a compromise because we are striking down uh, 377A, but then we are changing a law that is at a much higher level that would in future make any challenge to the discrimination that gay people face difficult and even impossible because the constitution will then formalize um, the discrimination that same-sex people, same-sex individuals face in the eyes of the law. I think the, the other danger of uh, this change to the constitution is that it might not just cover same-sex marriage but other aspects. Um, single parents, single individuals already face very high barriers in terms of being able to uh, purchase um, a place to stay from the government. Um, they are also not able to adopt children uh, after recent uh, legal changes. So these are connected to how the government has positioned uh, families as between men and women. And these uh, different policies might also become formalized in the law. And that means that any future advocacy or activism that uh, LGBT groups want would be severely limited and e even impossible. Singapore is known as quite a socially and politically conservative society. Do you see this as a small step in a slightly more progressive direction? This allows the conservative groups to be more assured and actually helps entrench the PAP's conservative rule. It is not from a rights-based perspective that we're looking at this amendment to the law. Um, what I worry is that going down the road, uh, conservative groups might be more emboldened to push their agendas. The, me the media tends to frame uh, Singapore as being a conservative society, but you do see that a lot of young people, uh, they do speak up against the anti-death penalty. They are progressive uh, in terms of the causes they support. They do support uh, same-sex marriage and they are more in favor of equality. Taiwan's private universities are struggling as the country's low birth rate leads to a drop in student numbers. Government figures show over 40% of the country's 104 private schools were in the red in 2020. To stay afloat, many are turning to international recruitment. Taiwan's 
An association of private schools says they will also have to develop speciality programs in order to survive. It says these schools will likely also be smaller than they are now. The association is calling on the Taiwan government to reassess foreign student quotas for public schools and offer financial and, and to private school students to help level the playing field. Taiwan has won the 2022 Junior League Baseball World Series Championship in the U.S. Swing and a miss. And Chinese Taipei have won the Junior League World Series. Zhongshan Junior High School from the central city of Taichung represented the Asia-Pacific region at the tournament. They beat the U.S.'s Southwest region squad 7-1 in the series final. Team Taiwan had a perfect 5-0 record during the tournament, scoring 61 runs and only giving up a single run in the last game. The Junior League series is for players between the ages of 12 and 14. This year's tournament was the first after a two-year break break caused by the pandemic. A cultural association in the southern city of Tainan is setting up a limestone park to preserve local history. Tainan's Baihe district was once renowned for its lime production industry. Lime used to be an important material in sugarcane production with the first mine in the area opened in 1923. But due to environmental concerns, Taiwan's government banned limestone mining in 1991. The association says it will initially focus on preserving the existing lime kilns while developing other attractions. It hopes to officially open the park next year. Some people live for a challenge and for one visually impaired young woman in Taiwan, that challenge is traditional Japanese archery. This is the story of how Yang Cha Chen stays focused on her target. We Yongsan 左边零点零五至零点一我的老师教学相长是一件很自然的事地板我一开始我要先贴个胶带
那一阵子我遇到了瓶颈，将近四个月没有上吧，那种失落感非常的重，因为旁边的学弟学妹啊，或是学长学姐啊，都上吧了。但是当那个挫折感来的时候，我就提醒自己接受那样的状态。在生活中的阅读啊，通常都是用手机在阅读我的书籍啊、书本。放大镜跟手机的功能对我来说是可以接触外界的一个方式。我自己的个性是比较喜欢。挑战一些平时比较做不到的事情，盲人的门球啦、田径啊、书法、啊、学公道这件事情，对我来说，它不会是一个阻碍，因为我已经是习惯去这么做了，去克服困难。别人可能要花。三年的时间就达到他想看见的目标，可是我知道我可能需要八年或甚至十年的时间才能去达成我想看见的目标。但是我觉得就是慢慢来，活到老学到老，然后成长到老。Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. I'm Inka Vat. Finally, we leave you with images of the 2022 Tijin Kite Festival in Kaohsiung in southern Taiwan. Over 100 huge whale kites and other undersea creatures attracted over 60,000 visitors to the area during the past weekend. For more stories from Taiwan and around the world, please download the Taiwan Plus app. Stay safe and see you next time.